Hello, hello. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we having a good B-Size Las Vegas? Can I get a thumbs up, a clap, something, anything? Yeah, right on. Right, yes. Cool, quick reminder, silence the cell phone. Nobody wants to hear your awesome ringtone. Uh, and then secondly, really excited to bring up Nicholas Carroll here to talk about OSINT, merging OSINT and RE workflows to simplify analysis. Without further ado, Nick, please, come on. Hey. Yeah, let's give a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nicholas Carroll. I'm a former CISO. Now I am a manager of a team that specializes mostly in cyber threat intelligence, defer, and things like that. Uh, we do fun stuff, which is why I didn't want to be a CISO anymore. So back to doing the really cool stuff there. Uh, my team does a lot of different things. And some of the things we run into is things that our SOC analysts pick up from client environments. They're not sure what it is. They'll bring it to us, and we try to figure out where to go from there. This whole talk stems from one of those events where a SOC analyst decided to ruin my Christmas. Uh, you know, it's, it's always a holiday, right? It could never be like Monday at 10 a.m. that they come up with something fun. It always has to be like right on top of a holiday. Uh, we had an analyst get an alert, uh, and it didn't make sense to him. Uh, and he's a good analyst, so I was like, well, I'm going to trust you on that one, right? It was triggering for some sort of ransomware activity, but it wasn't actually doing ransomware style activity in the environment. It didn't match any known samples of malware for things that we had. Uh, and so we were like, all right, well, this is kind of fun. Let's start with what we have, start pulling it apart and see where we can go from there. My analyst in this one, I'm going to shout him out real quick. Uh, his name is Brian. Uh, this was my malware Santa Claus, and a lot of the stuff that I talk about here is my side of this perspective. I hope one day I can drag him out and make him do a talk on his side of this whole thing, because uh, he does a lot of really good work on pulling things apart better than I do in the actual code, uh, whereas I do a lot more of the research side of house, right? So he decided that since he wasn't getting a holiday break, uh, he was going to make sure that I had something to do at my in-law's house while I was hanging out there. So it's a classic story, right? User clicks on a link, and they pick up something they shouldn't. A user wanted a popular application. In this case, they had wanted OBS Studio. And so they went out, and they found a link to click on. Uh, when we went back through this campaign, and we were kind of digging through where did it come from, and how did the user even find the thing, uh, this case, a lot of the stuff we found was malicious Google search ads were serving it up. Uh, but this user had specifically gone to YouTube, searched for a tutorial on OBS Studio, and then just clicked on the link in the description uh, and gone to the first thing that was there. And he picked, somehow he picked a tutorial that had like five views. So, you know, good job, guy. But while we are able to look at the domain uh, before we download things and figure out that that's not OBS Pro Studio's actual website, the user just goes, sees that, hey, this has got the logo that I saw in the tutorial, and the tutorial said to go here, so I'm going to click download, and I'm going to execute the thing, right? This campaign uh, was doing all kinds of stuff for all kinds of different applications, too, when we were digging through it. They had OBS Studio, uh, they had Notepad++, they had uh, Click Studio, and a bunch of other really popular applications, all in the same uh, domain host, like the root domain, was ossnincool.com, right? They just changed the subdomain for whatever thing they were impersonating, and they were serving it up all at the same time. But all we really had was an alert that said ransomware that wasn't ransomware. We had a domain, and we had a file hash. And that's about it, right? That doesn't really put us very high on the pyramid of pain. Uh, that puts us at the bottom with the stuff that changes too quickly to be useful for detection content engineering or doing anything super handy because the threat actor is just going to change the hash value and the domain and everything pretty fast, right? That's just the way it goes. You know, if we want to build detection content in it or figure out what we're looking at or where to go with this thing and make it useful, we need to try to get up towards the top towards you know, actual techniques or tactics or really dig into what the malware is doing. Uh, and our systems are just not giving us any info. The sandboxes are just kind of timing out or throwing a fit with it, right? We're not getting useful feedback from our own tool sets to pick this thing apart in a quick and easy way. 
But what we do know by digging through the website is that the link does give some kind of malware, right? When you click download, you do get some malware. And when you try to execute it, you get a thing that says, you know, notepad++.exe or obsstudio.exe or whatever version of the thing you tried to download, right? It had that name and it looked like it was supposed to be that application and it would execute. Except by the time that we were digging through this thing, because domain names, hashes, and other stuff changed so quickly, the C2 went down. And the project was pulled from the malware developer's side, right? So we now had alerts for stuff that didn't make sense. We had something that didn't match uh, known hashes, didn't match known info. Uh, and we kind of got stuck, right? We had a little bit of info at least for the way that executed, but it could no longer reach out and pull down anything from C2. It could no longer go anywhere, right? It just had a kind of a piece of like, had like junk malware now. Uh, but we knew we had something interesting, so we didn't want to necessarily give up on it. Uh, and we knew that most likely where one user gets it, it follows. Because while our user found this beautiful YouTube tutorial and downloaded the thing from there, what tends to happen is the users talk amongst themselves. And so that YouTube tutorial or that thing that they found spreads around as people talk amongst themselves and share it and go, oh man, I found this great thing. Go here and do this, right? But we at least got a little bit of information out of here. We got a user agent. We got a second stage URI, nothing that was functioning, but with the user agent, we were able to do a little bit of open source searching, okay? We turned it around because we weren't matching on known hashes and VT was coming up empty, virus total was coming up empty. We were able to take that little bit of info we had and we located a piece of research from a few months prior from Threatmon. They had found a brand new Steeler malware that was being advertised on Telegram and they posted their research in October and we stumbled across the thing in December, right? And this thing, if you've heard this name recently, it blew up in like February and was like everywhere for a little bit. Still pretty popular. But they found a beta version of it from the developer posted and they did some basic research on it and they had a little paper for it that they published in October. And so we were able to at least take this information and start going further and expand our search, right? We were able to feed off of what they've done and what we knew to start carving out for more information to see if we could find, hey, that C2 went down, but there's still active stuff out there, right? There's gotta be something we can use to build our materials and put things together. And finding this piece of information and putting it together with what we had gave us our O moment, right? That moment where we were able to go, oh, okay, now that we've seen this before, or at least we've seen that someone else has seen this before, and we have a general idea of how it used to function, we can take that, feed it back into our research, and kind of troll around a little bit. Using the information there, we found the active C2s. So the one we originally found had been abandoned, but we at least knew you know, some information about the server and how it was operating. And from the report from Threatmon, we knew the types of URIs and ports that they were expecting on the C2. We punched that into Shodan and we found some servers and we found some active ones. Yay. From here, we were able to start kind of pulling things together and making heads or tails of what we had found and really piece things together into something that worked for us for detection content, right? We were able to get fresher samples than what was in the Threatmon report because we were going out to the active C2 and pulling stuff down. We were able to pull that apart to an extent and actually analyze how it was functioning so we could write better detection content based on updated versions of the malware and how it operated even if you changed the C2 or the hash. So we noticed that you know, the HTTP user agent it was using to communicate hadn't changed. The actual back channel it was using to the C2 hadn't changed. And we were able to actually generate some detection content and key off of there. But one of the other really nice things we found in researching this and having this O moment is we had the name of the malware, right? And Threatmon didn't come up with that name themselves. 
That is the name the malware developer chose for this particular stealer. And that was the name that they had for all of their information about that particular stealer. So we were able to take that information and go out and basically find the malware developer, which was really, really handy. Because it turns out if you go out and actually do some searching outside of just trying to plow through the code on something, sometimes the malware developers will tell you how things work. And we'll look at that in a second. But yeah, definitely, uh, you know, what, one of the things that I run into with the guys that I have that do RE a lot is they get really hung up on the code. The code they have in front of them is the golden key to everything. It must be the golden key. It's the one thing they want to focus on. And the problem is, is that when you get into modern malware, you get into a lot of obfuscation techniques and it becomes very frustrating sometimes to pull apart the code and get something meaningful from it. Or it's written by somebody who is not, you know, English as a native language. So you wind up seeing a lot of Russian terminology used for variables and things that, you know, I'm not a Russian linguist at all. None of my guys are, right? So it kind of frustrates us and puts us in a weird spot. So, one of the things that I've been encouraging my RE guys to do, and anyone else who's in this kind of workflow, is to think about your processes and the people that are working on them and explore around just the piece of code in front of you. Actually look out to the world for what's posted and see where you can go from there and what you can garner. Because you can cut down on your analysis time when you find good information about that piece of malware, right? Either prior research, or just what is out there from the malware devs themselves because they like to talk sometimes. It becomes like typically a lot of the RRE guys I know, they go through a very linear workflow of pulling things apart. Bringing in outside research like OSINT, it kind of makes it a more cyclical piece. So if you think about like the threat hunting life cycle, uh, it's very much just a bunch of cyclical processes that feed back into each other, right? We've got our threat intel which goes into the SOC. The SOC does beautiful things with it. And either they come out with something on the side that needs a C-cert or they come back with just a little bit of cool information that we can turn into detection content, spread across everywhere, share as a Sigma rule, yada, 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 right? But it feeds back unto itself. We actually take these workflows and instead of just being like, oh, I'm going to give you this piece of information, you're going to search for it, and then the workflow stops you want to actually feed it back in. And that's what we do in a good threat hunting life cycle. And it's the same kind of thing we can do if we're bringing research more, outside research, into reverse engineering, where we can stop and pivot and bring things back in and kind of get it going into a cyclical approach. Uh, there's a really good uh, paper from a uh, Spanish university on a systemic approach to malware analysis. I've got the actual citation there because I'm going to steal their graphics real quick. Uh, that way I didn't have to reinvent my own because I am known to be lazy. And one of the things that they bring up in their systemic approach to malware analysis is the issues around specimen obfuscation and having to deal with a restricted execution environment, right? Actually having to bring this thing into some sort of VM sandbox. You can't just run it on anywhere or you're going to get ransomware everywhere in your network, right? You have to put it into its own little cubby and play with it in a safe space or risk real issues. But the biggest thing here is that specimen obfuscation. It becomes a really chaotic thing to try to pull things apart when the malware developer has purposely just dumped a plate of spaghetti in front of you, right? In their paper, uh, they actually are pulling apart multiple samples as you know, proof for how to use a systemic approach to malware analysis. And one of the things they run into is Debugger checks, right? That's super common now for a lot of malware. A lot of malware these days, it's VM aware. It's debugger aware. It's pumped. They're taking garbage data, it's just a bunch of extra zeros, throwing them at the end of the file and pumping it out to make it look huge on disk. So if you try to upload it to something like VirusTotal, it won't execute. We've had a couple of samples that have been over a gig. Uh, my favorite one so far, when we unpacked it, it was 99 gigabytes showing up on disk, which in my mind, I was like, what, what happens if I unpack this thing on a computer that's like a hard drive is full? Does your malware just not work? 
right? So you wind up in this situation where you're trying to dig through all of this junk that's making it problematic. And that's where documentation comes to the rescue. Malware these days tends to be done as a service because everything has to be a service or a subscription, even malware. And when you make things a service, you have to provide customer service. And customer service means documentation and training. So if you get a little bit of information, IPs, domain names, malware names, anything like that that you can kind of start building off of for your searches, you can take that information out to Telegram and Tor and other places and start finding the documentation from the developers. With Radamanthus Stealer, they've got beautiful documentation that tells you exactly how the whole thing works from the server side to the end of the infection. The whole thing put together so you can figure out exactly what settings you need when you're building this thing out there. And it's just on the open, open internet for anyone to go get, right? It's not really hidden that much. So we can actually use the documentation provided by the developers who will sometimes tell you things like, hey, here is how I'm telling if you're running me in a VM environment, right? I'm looking for two CPUs or less. I'm looking for the screen resolution. I'm looking for weird usernames that typically show up in sandboxes. I'm looking for these running process names. And you can bring that back to your frustrated malware researcher who's smacking his face against the code as hard as he can to try to make something make sense and go, okay, just change the settings in the VM environment and suddenly we can bypass this whole thing. The other nice thing that you can do sometimes is you can go out and find stuff that's really hot, fresh now, right? Like before, it's off in, you know, a CISA advisory or a SANS stormcast or anything like that. You can find new samples. So let's do a really simple hunt together, all right? Uh, this is one I ran across a few months ago. Uh, and it was hilarious to me because like the same day I posted it at Twitter, like three other people stumbled onto it like the same time. It's like, all right, cool. Who gets to claim it? Mystic Stealer. I just went to Shodan and I typed in the word Stealer. Not every OSINT hunt has to be super complicated. Some of them can be really silly, simple, and still get great results. Because with just the word Stealer, I was able to find some titled pages in the HTML code that said Stealer. And when we went to them, it was a Mystic Stealer login page, which now gives us IP addresses for C2s, which we can turn around into virus total and find where our relationships are. And we can find the actual files that are communicating with those C2s. So even if the C2s are recent and they're not getting good hits uh, for like your network security appliance or anything like that, you can come through and at least see, hey, I've got some really nice fresh stuff here that I can use. And same thing, right? That one's, you know, they've, they've uh, updated Mystic Stealer. It's not as easy to find. Uh, but there is one, and I recorded this one uh, recently. So if you wanted to, you could just go open Shodan on your phone right now and type in Stealer. Uh, and there is one that will show up and work, right? It's called Easy Stealer. Uh, and it's not very well put together, but there's no blog posts on it right now, really. There's, I think I found a single tweet and the tweet wasn't anything around, you know, Stealer or anything like that, right? The tweet was just like, hey, somebody recently posted on a hack forum that they're selling a new Golang Stealer called Easy Stealer. That was the tweet. Well, if we go out to Shodan and we type in Stealer, we get a Russian IP address. Uh, and those are great because that's where most of the malware comes from these days. So we can go here and see that we've got port 3001 open. And on port 3001 is an HTML page, and it's a login page for a thing that says in its title, Easy Stealer. Yeah, it's, it's right there, right? And I mean, honestly, they could come up with better naming for these things. A lot of these devs, when they first make these things, for some reason, default to just calling it Stealer and not like using something better. But you can go out and find the dashboard straight off of Shodan for the C2. And this one's not fully functional because it looks like most likely someone has recently bought the source code and is using it. So it's just kind of there and it's not ready to rock and roll quite yet. So this one is very fresh and ready to go. Like I said, anybody today in this room, go make your blog post about Easy Stealer and beat like CrowdStrike or somebody else to the punch before they get there. 
But you can take this IP address for this dashboard. You can plug that back into VirusTotal or whatever your repository of choice is, right? And you can see what files are communicating with it to get fresh samples. And this one, I'll pop over there. A few vendors have picked up on the IP address, right? Not everybody, but a few. But there are some files when we go to relations on this one. And one of those files is basically the actual source code from the developer that you buy when you go out to the dark web forum and buy Easy Stealer. Someone uploaded it to VT right before the post was made uh, on the hacking forum advertising the thing for sale. Which means there's a good chance the developer might have done it to themselves, as they tend to do. Uh, it's this one right here, easy64.exe. Wow, great, great way to obfuscate your name on this one. Caught you a little early. We had the same thing with Radamanthus. Uh, there were a bunch of samples that were just called rad.exe really early on. Uh, and when we were digging through it, later on I found a Telegram post from the malware developer of Radamanthus who said, hey, if you're buying, please stop uploading to VirusTotal. <laughs> so, <laughs> just as a warning there. But this is a fresh sample. It's a few weeks old, and mostly it's undetected right now. So it's a great piece to actually go out and pull apart and get some good detection content out of it. Especially because you can get good detection content out of it without really having to do a whole lot of extra effort. Because once again, the developer has made a nice little website where you can go and you can look up how the thing works, what you need to do to set it up. Everything you need is on this page, just on the open internet for anyone to go and get and read because they're providing excellent customer service to the people who buy it and to the people who now have to research it and pull it apart, right? And again, there's that easy x64.exe. That is actually the piece of code that you get from the developer to set up and run your own server for this stealer. And it's just on VirusTotal. So if you've got a VirusTotal account, you can just go get it for yourself without even having to pay. So, really easy to incorporate these things into your RE workflows. There's really simple tools for a lot of the stuff. We got only a couple minutes, so I'm gonna sprint through them, right? A couple of things that I like to do when I'm trying to bring this stuff together or go out and find stuff to incorporate and pull back our research here. Uh, dark web search engines, Onion Land, Torch, these are great. Problem with this is a lot of stuff that's on the dark web is super ephemeral. Uh, you find it once and it's gone kind of thing, right? If you've got some cash to spend, I would highly recommend that you look instead at maybe getting something like SOS Intel. If you've got really deep pockets, you can get reported future. Uh, I don't have really deep pockets personally, so when I do my personal projects, I use SOS Intel. Uh, they go out, they search everything, they cache it all from Telegram, from the dark web, lots of really good stuff. And they've got a researcher account that's super affordable. Other things you can use, obviously Shodan, right? But don't just stop at Shodan, because not always will Shodan find it. A lot of people have picked up on what the scanning IPs are for Shodan, and therefore they block Shodan. But they don't think to block everything because there's far too many scanning search engines at this point in the world. So you can go out and check the other databases at Census, at Binary Edge, at ZoomEye, et cetera, right? Go out and kind of poke through all of them. Uh, Binary Edge right now, it doesn't show up on uh, Shodan, but if you type in Stealer to Binary Edge, you'll find Cube Stealer, which is another newer one that you can pull apart for fun. Other handy tools, URL scan, if you want to go to a web page, uh, like a, you know, C2 page that you think you found and you're just trying to do it quick and dirty, you can pop it into URL scan, which is basically a web page sandbox. Security trails is beautiful. Uh, it's IP and DNS history. There's a few other tools like complete DNS and things like that that do it. Personally, I've found security trails tends to have the most complete database. So we can go out and find, say, previous DNS names that someone might have been using or IP addresses that might have been tied to that DNS in the past. Other fun things, DNS twist. DNS twist is a great tool to go grab from GitHub to use to find potential typo squatting domains uh, because a lot of these things tend to come off of, you know, typo squats of popular applications. So you can go ahead and set that up and roll. 
Outside of that, your classic tools like Wireshark, Nmap, and Foca. And that's it. Hopefully you guys get to have your own O moments doing OSINT with malware. Um, where do you go to find these tools if you're new to um, things like um, Scent and stuff like that? Uh, so Google is your friend for a lot of this stuff. Uh, shockingly, you know, most of it's pretty well documented. There's also a couple really good GitHub repos where you can find stuff here. Uh, Deep Dark CTI and a few others, if you go out to GitHub, actually have pulled together some nice starting points. Uh, for you to go out and get either information on stuff that's on the dark web, where to go and get it, or get tools. Uh, you can find a few start.me's as well for OSINT items. Those are really good starting points. So. Awesome. Right on. Thanks again, dude. Thank you.